season, new coach. That's great. How you doing? Not to be a spinner. I think we For me, the success lies in developing the kids as people, as basketball players. So as long as I leave everyone there better than when we came in together, then that's that's the win for me. They trying to hold me back, but I never delay. Nah, I never delay. Nah, I never delay. Play that type of music, make them want to replay. Nah, I never delay. Nah, I never delay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Coach's Call. My guest today, I have Coach Greg Mpofu. He's been involved in the community, in the basketball community here in England for over 10 years, working with top clubs. He's recently won a National League title with the Lancashire Spinners. Um, and he's here to share his stories, his upbringings, how he's got into the game of basketball, and also share his great insights and knowledge of the game. Welcome to the show, Coach Greg. Morning, Clive. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's great to have you on today. Um, introduce yourself, just a quick introduction to the people that may have not heard of you and uh, want to know a bit more about yourself. Uh, yeah, pretty boring guy, if I'm being honest. Um, uh, Greg and Bob, I'm 32 years old. I was born in Laos, Zimbabwe. Uh, Came to the UK in 2002, I was aged 15. Um, I've, I've lived in this country ever since. So that's, uh, we're getting close to 18 years now. So longer than <laughs> I was back home. But um, yeah, I was probably, compared to everyone else, a latecomer to the game of basketball. Um, it was in 2002 that I first got involved in any kind of um, structured basketball at all. And um, it's kind of been one of the, the better decisions I've made for myself since then. I mean, you boast an impressive resume. I mean, you've been coaching since 2009, I believe. Um, and you said that you came to England when you were only 14, correct? Or 12? Uh, 15. 15, 15. Um, how was it like, did you ever play basketball back in your home country? Or was it just here that you just started to discover it more? Yeah, I played a little bit, like as much as you can call it that. My cousins, mm. uh, friends in the park or in someone's backyard, you know, but for, uh, in my mind, it was a sport exclusively for people of a certain height, you know, like the fairground mm. rides where you have to be at least this tall to ride. And I was not. I was like <laughs> five foot three until I turned 14. Um, I was a short kid and then quite quickly I grew to the height I am now which is still not very tall I'm 5'11 on a good day but I'm a lot um, more able to compete with the bigger boys at that size than I am at 5'3 so I kind of you know as a sport I'd always watched um, I remember watching a lot of basketball with my dad on, on VHS tapes um, back end of the 90s, early 2000s and stuff like that. Uh, I always enjoyed the game. I knew a lot of the personalities in the NBA. Um, I could pick them out of a lineup, you know, that kind of thing. But never, never really got involved in playing because of my size. So once I felt I was able to play a little bit, I just jumped into the first sort of session I could find. Um, I sucked, as you could expect. But I really enjoyed it and I kept coming back. And, you know, I've, I've, I've over the years found different ways to enjoy the game. And I'm, I'm definitely glad that it's something that I did. As you mentioned, I think the, the, the 90s and late 90s especially was, um, well, throughout the whole 90s, uh, was the Jordan era, isn't it? I remember watching VHS tapes of Michael Jordan before before pre-YouTube and pre all these other uh, internet websites and video streaming sites. Um, I remember I just used to hit the rewind button and play uh, just and try imitate the Jordan moves. Uh, looking back, I must have looked very ridiculous because, you know, I didn't have half the athleticism and half the capabilities of a Michael Jordan. But those were the fun days and I remember it so vividly. Um, and 
I'm not saying the generation now, of course, you know, they have access to everything. Um, and I'm not jealous of that because I loved actually watching the tapes and, and having that experience because that was what was available to us at the time. Um, so you're, you're now in, uh, did you move to Manchester straight away from uh, your home country, Zimbabwe? Or was it? Um, uh, yeah, uh, Manchester was, uh, well, I'll call it Greater Manchester. I live in a little town called Duckinfield. Duckinfield, it's yeah. part of Greater Manchester. Um, and to be honest, the, the house we moved in when I first got here is literally 200 yards that way from where I live now. So this is, apart from heading off to university, uh, mm. this is where I've lived ever since. Wow. Um, so you're probably looking for a local basketball club, so you, you're gaining a bit more interest, uh, thinking, you know, I could, I could probably tackle this sport. What was your first basketball club? I didn't actively go looking in terms of basketball clubs, but I, you know, kind of e e eavesdropped on a few guys who were talking about basketball. I rolled up on one of my friends in school. I was like, hey, you were talking about basketball. Like, what's going on? Where, where's that happening? And there just happened to be a school session that day um, at All Saints Catholic. So played a little bit of that. And after the session, he was like, listen, Friday night, there's a, there's a session at Copley. Come down, it's just, you know, 250 pay and play. Let's go. Like, okay, let's do that. Uh, I went down. There was about 30 of us there, which is, you know, looking back on it now, that's way too many people um, <laughs> for like an open scrimmage type of thing. But um, the one thing, that I didn't realize I was immediately good at at the time. But obviously, as time passes, I kind of realize now is um, because of having played football and stuff like that, you know, I was pretty solid in terms of trying at least to play defense. You know, just kind of trying to understand how to keep someone in front of you, that kind of thing, without knowing what you're doing but just keeping someone in front of you like you would in a football game, that type of thing. So the guy watching who ran the session, a man named Jeff Curtis, he must have picked up on that. And he said, look, come down, come down every week, um, an hour before the scrimmage, and we'll work with you on, on a few things. And, you know, we did that for a little while. And it, it kind of kick-started my my involvement in playing as someone that knows what they're doing. <laughs> Shout out, Jeff. Um, giving you that opportunity in time. Um, so, as you, as you mentioned with football, transitioning into basketball, I think that's a very valid point. Some of the skill sets and some of the, the muscle memories, um, the athletic, athleticism that you actually gain from, from that sport, you can apply it to basketball. I definitely agree. Steve Kerr came out uh, with an interesting article recently. Uh, he said that playing football would actually benefit basketball players, especially playing at a very younger age, like the grassroots age. Um, we have NBA players that started. Steve Nash, for example, was uh, grew up playing football because of his uh, father and his background in the sports. Um, so I, I don't think, I think it's more common, especially in the UK, for athletes to transition into uh, different sports, especially football to basketball. What do you think of that, Coach? Well, um, a lot of what we call invasion sports, um, football, basketball, rugby, you know, usually team sports where it's easier to score from closer in so the other team is trying to stop you from getting closer, you know, the, it works on the same principle that you want to keep your body in between uh, the attacking player and the goal, whatever that may be. Maybe a goal in football, the try line in rugby, the basket in basketball, netball is the same concept, although, you know, contact is a little bit less prevalent in that sport. But with that concept comes, you know, a lot of transferable skills, like you said, footwork. You know, being able to to run and turn your hips, being able to move laterally, being able to jump. So all of that is relevant across all these sports I've mentioned. 
Um, and it's only really the details and intricacies where it starts to get a little bit different. I agree. Um, great points there, coach. So I think you mentioned something about university. Do you mean, um, how was it like? Did you study up, up in North as well? No, um, I left the Northwest to go to university. I went down to mm -hmm. Cardiff, what was known as UIC, University of Wales Institute of Cardiff, now known as Cardiff Met. Cardiff Met. Um, very, very different um, environment, living in Wales as opposed to, you know, the, the larger urban area of, Man of Manchester. Uh, but definitely appreciated everything I learned down there, met a lot of nice people. Um, and basically that was the beginnings of me kind of taking, taking coaching seriously. Did you um, get involved with the basketball club and the program at Cardiff Met? Yeah, you know, like um, average player that I was, I was involved in, with, in the box first team, with the national team there as well, national league team, sorry. They well. still have that, right, I believe? We're still running yeah, that national yeah, league team. Uh, they, they've had it throughout. Um, it's actually a, a lot, a lot of growth has happened um, in that program, even looking from a distance now, you know, um, particularly with the, the junior program that they've grown. Um, and obviously they've got um, a WBBL uh, franchise out there, Cardiff Met Archers. So it's, in terms of developing basketball in Wales, they're definitely key players in that as the highest profile program that they have over there and the infrastructure that they have within the university that supports the club is uh, very good. You know, from the, the non-playing aspects, using the university resources, lecturers and students for stuff like performance analysis, mm. um, where you've got students learning in and around the program about the processes and everything that we do about that. And, you know, the more, the more of that kind of stuff that we start to get in the game in this country will only be, you know, a good thing as we kind of professionalize our game. So you were studying sports coaching there? Or, or, or what exactly were you studying at Cardiff, Mac? Yeah, yeah I, I did study that. Um, well, it's called it sports conditioning rehab and massage, SCRAM, mm. as they called it. <laughs> um, and then did performance analysis as well. Yeah. Um, definitely enjoyed both, but SCRAM, not as much, not even anywhere close as much as I enjoy performance analysis, um, which I still use for myself up to this day. Um, the honest truth is that it's, it's, it's become difficult to look at a game um, the same way ever since being there because, you know, I'm, I'm always breaking down the game in my mind. I'm always looking at little, in little details in everything that's happening in the game to see um, how I can do something differently, how can I improve on something, um, looking for the why a lot of the time as to why people did certain things. So it's, it's definitely been a game changer for me. I mean, um, that's such great insight, Coach, because looking at, say, the younger generation and the, the coaches that want to come up, um, it's great to hear more about courses such as the one that you were studying, and I still believe they run it to this day, um, because it helps develop a coach. And when you say the education that you received from that university and you're still applying the practices that you've, you've learned, that's amazing, you know, because uh, there's not a lot of courses that can produce that same quality, um, which is pivotal. Um, it's great that you knew, would per se, in, uh, from that age, kind of, and developed kind of exactly what you wanted to go into. And that course really helped shape that, which is really, really, really good to hear. Um, so say you've graduated university now. I think one of the first roles that you've had in coaching was in 2009, correct? Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you, TCV Arrows ultimately was what I would term a failed project, but well-intentioned. So what we did is went back to 
the grassroots of you know the same level where I developed, which was taking kids, enthusiastic, want to learn, want to play all the time in a central venue. And the intention was to take kids from that central venue and amalgamate them into a national league program. Not to say, you know, that central venue league team or making international league program. Now we're taking the whole league and packaging it together to make a national league program. Um, there were some actually some very good players amongst that group, but not understanding how to run a club, not understanding how to sort of properly develop players at that point meant that, you know, there were a lot of problems operationally, a lot of problems in terms of delivery of what we were doing as coaches. So ultimately, um, it was it, it was very difficult, but as I'm sat here talking to you, there's a lot of lessons that were taken from then by not just myself, a lot of the other people that were involved. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's something that I, you know, definitely could do a lot differently for us to do that today. But it was something that if done properly with the intentions that we had, we could have had something quite quite good on our hands. I tend to not use the word failure coach. I try to always mention and, 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 and say it's a positive learning experience in a way. Um, we always learn from our failures. Um, and I think, as you mentioned, it, it sounded like, as you said, you had a, a group of talent there um, and you just needed the right management and guidance. And that comes with years of experience, as you mentioned. I think, it, like you said, if you're leading it now, be a completely different story would you agree yeah and more than anything else a key lesson that i can take away from that mm. is not to try and do it by myself <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> um having different people with different roles in uh, different responsibilities is something that is overlooked and i know you know it's, it's kind of the reality of club basketball around this country there's a lot of one man two man bands out there you know doing a lot of hard work but you know at a certain point it takes its toll yes you know yes. so you you have blind spots there that you don't even know exist or mm. you know you're spreading yourself way too thin and you're not doing any one thing particularly well you're average at a lot of things um but you know it's it's not to say that it can't be done but there's definitely better ways to do it. I think a key lesson I've learned from developing clubs and trying to, to build programs, as you mentioned, I, I was one of those one, one man, two man bands. Um, I try to, sometimes you feel you can do everything, but ultimately, you know, learning how to delegate, learning to find the right people to, to help and have more specific roles within clubs, which they are stronger in their expertise um, is kind of a skill in a way and, and it's, it helps build your leadership because it helps develop the club um, and again more work gets done and you can be more efficient and more effective in the way that you work which is like coaching and focus more on your roles um, which I definitely think is really really important especially when building a program. Um, so we're now moving on to stop basketball club yeah talk more about this because it seems like you had more of a would you say a more positive and more progressive experience with them yeah you know it's a a period of a lot of growth for myself um to begin with i was still playing um my last year playing was 2012 2013 but i was also assistant coach as well with the, that same men's team and, you know, it was a situation where even though I was playing, I really, really focused a lot of my energy, the vast majority of my energy on, on trying to help with the coaching. Um, you know, my body was breaking down for various reasons. I wasn't as effective as a player as I used to be. And I was aware of that. 
So I really focused on being able to, you know, start to, to sort of plow that furrow as a coach and start to understand what way it is I can be effective in that role. Um, the year following that, 2013, 14, I stopped playing altogether and began the season as the AC. We had a good roster, a very good roster. Funny enough, <laughs> some of the guys back then are on my roster now at Lancashire Spinners. Mm. Um, and we were doing very well in the league. The head coach left and I took over as head coach. And we were top of Division Three North, as it was at the time. Uh, but unfortunately, club finances meant that we couldn't actually finish out the season um, with that team. Uh, so the team had to be withdrawn from the league, which was, it was a shame. But um, a lot of the, the lessons I took from that season in terms of working with um, with some talented players and learning how to sort of manage that talent and, and channel their energies in the right way to get them to work together in a way that made sense. Um, definitely, definitely crucial for, for what I'm doing now. And that led up to more opportunities. I think shortly after you're working with Basketball England as a scout and an analyst, that's something that you said you were quite passionate about, um, learning at Cardiff, you know, analysing videos, etc., analysing the game from that perspective. Um, speak more about that role. Uh, so that was more in the region, um, in the in the northwest. Uh, what used to be your RDT teams, regional development tournament teams. Um, the under 15s I was working with uh, David Atkinson, uh, who also coaches up here in the northwest. This previous season, he coached Thameside in D3. And you know, when he while he was working with that program, I came in just to help him look at. Um, his group in a different in a different way, um, sort of identify sort of key areas that he wanted to look at for for their performance. So KPIs, key performance indicators, and we did that over the summer leading into the tournament, which they ultimately won. Um, you know, there was a, a very strong group of girls in that team, a lot of whom went on to play. Uh, national team basketball at various age groups, um, a lot of whom went on to play college basketball in the United States and are still there. So, you know, that was kind of my first um, real application of those skills that I picked up in any, any real way. Um, while it wasn't like a proper appointed or official role, it was sort of like more as a favor Mm. But, mm. you know, just because I'm doing someone a favor and it's not an official capacity, um, I'm still going to do it properly as far as, far as I can. And, you know, being able to, to be in a situation where there's, there's tangible results from it, you know, just helped with my confidence in that way. Well, as you mentioned, you know, there's, there's talent that you were actually... Uh, analyzing and you could see um, talent that's probably grown to play in, I don't know, the WBBL, played at high levels probably now, uh, which is amazing to see the growth, isn't it? Because, of course, you've been involved with the Northwest region for a very, for quite a while, um, which goes on to my next topic. I think um, you went into Manchester Magic, isn't it? Uh, the One of the biggest, would say, clubs in, in the UK. How is it like coaching in the Magic? Um, it's hard to explain because, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. So it was 2014-15 that I first started coaching their assistant coach with the, um, actually things changed very quickly once I started there. I was meant to be with um, the under-16 boys, which ended up being under-16 boys and under-18 men. So all in all, it was two groups and three teams I was involved in. Um, straight off the bat and the first conversation I had with Joe Forber when I started there is 
he, he said this to me and I've never forgotten it. Um, whatever you think you are as a coach, I don't really care because you can learn how to coach. We need good people. You know, so can you be that? Uh, he didn't wait for an answer. He just left me with that to think about. So um, obviously that's going to stick in your head. So it gives you that straight away off the bat. Um, but yeah, he he sort of said that to reframe the way I was thinking, even though it took a long while for me to actually realize that's the message he was giving me. Where he's saying, look, forget about X's and O's, forget about winning games, forget about all of that. Okay, it's not going to matter if these kids aren't responding to you because you're an idiot. You know, so that's... That's, that was an important thing I had to learn while I was there. And, you know, we, we had relative success uh, with that boys, those boys' teams during that season, 2014-15. The under-18s won the National Cup here in Manchester. And the under-16s ultimately went on to win the national playoffs. Um, that was over in Sheffield. And... A lot of the guys on those teams, um, uh, the 18s and the 16s, actually went on to do some pretty decent things. Again, national teams, college basketball. <coughs> but um, being some years removed from that, I figured that I've actually changed as a coach since then. You know, when you walk into what is now Manchester Basketball Centre, was the Amici Basketball Centre, it's hard not to notice that there's banners everywhere commemorating titles and stuff like that. And you feel a certain amount of pressure to live up to that. Um, and I did. I did straight away. You know, how am I going to be the guy that's involved in, in losing? I was well aware that the under-16 age group, they'd won four titles in a row up to that point. Um, you don't want to be um, part of the group that breaks that streak. And that pressure, whether it's real or imagined, to produce results will influence the way you operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So I became very X and O focused, X and O, X and O, this let's get good at doing this, let's run these players, let's do it. And, you know, a, a lot of people will know that same sort of situation, um, having been through it themselves. And as I say, it did produce a lot of the desired results in terms of the scoreboard and winning games. But as you reflect afterwards, you come to realize that, well, that probably would have happened anyway. <laughs> if you look mm -hmm. at, you know, the collection of talent that was on the floor together. So was that, was doing it that way as important as maybe preparing these guys for the next level? So, you know, obviously while you're in it, you don't look at it that way, but being, being some years removed from it, it becomes a bit clearer. I remember going into the Manchester National Sports Centre, you know, the Performance Centre, um, and it was, I told, when you were explaining it, I to totally feel that, that, that exact emotions in a way, the, the way you see it, you know, the banners up high, you see the bleachers, you know, wow, this is impressive. I've only been there for coaching clinics. Um, I've never actually had the opportunity to coach um, a game there, let alone run a session. So um, as you, I can only imagine the pressures of, of actually leading a program and leading a club, especially in the, the home city, uh, must be must be a great feeling to actually achieve it. Uh, but as you mentioned, it's it's the bigger goal, isn't it? Um, of course, delivering championships and and succeeding is is fantastic. Um, it's great for the program, but as you look at back on it, it's more of the development of the player. And you've probably seen where they have all gone in their careers. Um, 
and maybe you think you, you probably had you could have had more of an impact and, and helped them in, in certain ways. Um, you were you were an assistant coach there at the time, isn't it? Was that correct, coach? Yeah, um, particularly those first two years was mm. you know working a lot more in the background and supporting the head coach and trying to do it that way. And what I want to say for that, being an assistant coach is, is enjoyable, especially as you're developing as a coach in this way, that a lot of the time you're actually more connected to the players than the head coach is. You know, they, they probably view you as being more approachable and you can sort of speak to them in a more relatable way in terms of delivering um, whatever the message is or helping them to understand a certain thing. Or even when it comes time to maybe, you know, for lack of a better term, deliver that uh, slap on the wrist, you know, you can do it in a probably more gen gentle way than ultimately the CEO mm. needs to do it. So it's, Having been through that and learned that way because, you know, at Stockport, I didn't spend very long as an assistant coach, didn't spend very long as a head coach. So understanding the difference in dynamic between the two and how to, to make those two roles come together and work is something I learned at Manchester during those first early years. I always think it's a it's great when you get two different coaches with two different backgrounds and different styles of coaching. Um, if you have two coaches, like a head coach, or assistant coach, that's very alike, you know, there's no way to differentiate who's the good cop and the bad cop in a way. <laughs> it's just literally uh, uh, the players just like, Oh, wow. We, we fear both of them, but it's nice to have a balance where the players can approach the assistant coaches know and approach to head coaches and, and there's a different relationship because ultimately uh, they will have a relationship with the coaching staff um, yeah, in different it's, ways. It's not, it's not as um, a good cop, bad cop scenario the way I look at it, whereas if you look at it, a coach, head coach has to have probably more of a macro um, outlook on the, on the program, on the team and the players. Whereas an AC, you can kind of have a bit more of a micro approach, mm. um, depending on your, your role and your responsibilities. Um, for instance, uh, throughout my career, my biggest thing has been developing and teaching defensive principles and helping players to understand that kind of thing. So with that being my purview, I'm able to go to each player as needed and kind of break down things a little bit more intricately for them to start to understand what it is that they're being asked to do, uh, start to understand the way things uh, need to work for the overall group as according to what it is that they need to do to contribute to that. So yes. that's kind of where uh, the, I make the difference. Uh, in my own head and the way I, I approach the role. Yeah, because I, I, I definitely, I agree on that coach because I, I, I definitely, um, I speak to other coaches that have done the AC role. Sometimes they just don't know when to get involved. Um, do they, when, when to actually put their input in? Um, are you just the assistant coach that just gets the towels and just gets the stuff like that and, and just help out and, and just come in and, you know, put your hands in? Or are you an assistant coach that really knows their specialty expertise, as you said? You're a, def you're a very defensive-minded coach. You're, you're good at teaching those principles. Um, do we apply that successfully and effectively within the program under the head coach? Or do you, does the assistant coach just kind of, um, it's difficult when they don't really know their role. So it looks like you understood that role well and you implemented that correctly. Do you see where I'm coming from with that? Yeah, and a funny thing about that is, I wouldn't even say it's a thing that I particularly understood. It's probably a quirk of my personality. And my very first session on the floor with, um, it was the under 18 men 
that, that it was uh, in 2014-15. Uh, head coach is running a drill and I'm off to the sideline, probably trying my best not to be involved. But I kept seeing the same mistake being made in the same place. And me being just the way I am, it was really irritating. I was like, there's no way you don't see this. Um, so I just kind of, I blew my whistle, jumped in. I was like, okay, look, this is what's happened the last seven times down the floor. For the same reason, in the same way. I don't understand what it is that we're trying to achieve here. But for one, nobody's talking to each other. So I can, you can probably predict that this is what's going to happen. So you know, I kind of broke it down for them, tried to correct that mistake, stepped back a little bit. And then after the session, Joe Forbo approached me, I'm thinking, oh, hell, man, here we go. I'm going to get a wrap. Um, and he came to me and said, look, I don't really know how long I've been doing this. Uh, he's probably been coaching for a few years. He said, I don't really know how long I've been doing this, but that's probably the first time I've seen an assistant coach come in in the first session and <laughs> just jump into a drill like that. And here's me still waiting for the telling off. He just walked off. <laughs> but but so to me... Like, was, that, was that a good thing or a bad thing? I still don't know. <laughs> but these are the stories which I, I hear about. You know, some coaches, assistant coaches will have their whistle in and think, hmm, should I blow it? You know, I've, I've been seeing it, this, like you said, this issue, or in games, should I say it? But some coaches will be, especially head coaches that I've spoken to, they're very receptive, and they actually want their assistant coaches to speak out. Would you agree on that? Yeah, it's, it's about building that dynamic, you know. Mm. Um, if you initially build a dynamic that you're there to observe and not say anything, that's how it's going to be. Yes. Um, you know, that's not to say that I intentionally uh, did that. It just, that's kind of how it happened uh, just because of the way I am. But you can probably imagine right now, if I hadn't done that and I wait till the end of the session to say, Hey, by the way, this was going on. You might've been like, well, why the hell didn't you say something? <laughs> you know, so it's just, if if you're gonna do something, you you need to back yourself while you're doing it. Trust your instincts. Um, of course, there's something to be said for not overstepping your bounds. But as long as you know you're probably well intentioned and you know what it is that you're trying to say. Yes. You know, pick your spots. It could have well been a case of a hey, come here to one player and I talked to them on the side, but because everybody was doing it, there was no time for that. Mm -hmm. By the time I've walked around the court to talk to the head coach to say, this is what I'm seeing, this is what's happening, they've probably done it another four or five times. Mm -hmm. And we're losing time in practice to correct that. So I just thought, look, I just need to deal with this now. Yeah. From the outside perspective, some, some people may think, especially people coming into coaching, um, they always want the head coach role, isn't it? Um, some people may think, you know, who, who, who wants to be an assistant? But what I've grown over the community and, and, and speaking to other coaches, being an assistant coach actually is a craft. You know, you really need to, it's all about timing and it's all about, as you mentioned, key things defining what you're really strong at. You know, NBA have consultants that come in, for example, that come in and give their expertise on, I don't know, maybe it might be skills or maybe it might be uh, scouting. These, these staff members come in to help the program. Um, but for the assistant coach, as you mentioned, it's all about defining the roles. And I think a lot of people, a lot of assistant coach are, are happy, which, is, which makes me happy to, be, to, to hear, um, but they're happy in their roles as assistant coach. And they'd rather not even be the head coach. They actually want their roles as assistants because they feel that's what they're strong at. Uh, is this something that you encourage and, and something that you believe in? Yeah, absolutely. And um, <laughs> uh, a former colleague of mine, Natalie Furtado, that I worked with at Manchester Mystics when I was coaching the girls over there, um, <laughs> kind of had to be dragged kicking and screaming into a head coach role 
that she was actually very good at. But the, the thing that I understand now is that she did not want to sort of lose um, what it was that she brought in an assistant coach capacity. Yes. You know, she's <laughs> very good at the, the interpersonal connections that she has with the girls. Um, you know, very, very pastorally sound. You know, and they, they, they really do respond to her in that way. But she's also a very good basketball coach. And I was kind of like trying to encourage her to, you know, move along with it. And she she'd coached before. She's not something she was like she she never coached before. And I was saying, look, at this level, yes, you can do it. And I don't think that she doubted that, but she just wanted to sort of still be what she was to these kids and you know that's that's important to have people like that because there's only so many head coaching roles of course but there's many more assistant coach roles there's no limit on how many assistant coaches you can have yes yes you know, it's, so it's it's very true coach at one point with um manchester mystics under 16s and under 18s uh in 2018 19 at one point there were four of us so in any given configuration you want to look at it that's head coach and three assistants mm. so and we all had our particular roles particular responsibilities different styles of delivery obviously we have our own personalities our own relationships within the team and you know that dynamic worked really well. Would it have worked as well with just one head coach, one assistant? Probably not because there were so many different things that we needed to focus on with such a large group because the 16s and 18s were amalgamated, in, particularly in practice. You know, you're looking at 24 kids on the floor. Do you want to do that between two of you? Probably not. Uh, it's a lot of pe people running around. Um, so... Yeah, I definitely appreciate, you know, the the roles of assistant coaches, career assistants, if you will. Um, and to be honest, if it turned out that way, I wouldn't have minded being one of those guys, but it just obviously yeah. turned out differently. I think in this country, it's luxury to have four coaches on the floor. I mean, that's amazing to have four coaches on the floor at one point. Um But yeah, so moving on to, to the opportunities that, you that presented itself at the time so i believe that you went on to work with basketball england is this correct again that's still in the regions because um, yeah. uh what you want to now call the aspire program was a lot different as recently as pff, when's the last time i did 2017 yes so in 2016 i was assistant coach with the under 17 boys regional team uh head coached by danny burn who's at manchester giants head coach in the bbl and you know over that summer in 2016 we were coaching the boys and it's meant to be according to uh what are the british basketball principles of play i.e you you you're operating with half a mind as a national team selector, but within your region to then go and present these boys to actual national team selectors at the tournament. Um, so that dynamic, okay, so again, it was one head coach, two assistant coaches, more assistant coach jobs than the head coach jobs. So doing that was um, different to how it happened with the under 15s with Dave Atkinson, where I was a lot more involved on the floor. Um, I was given many different responsibilities. One of the key responsibilities I had was uh, building a, a rotation, rotation pattern in terms of uh, substitutions, um, which was a lot more intricate than it probably needed to be. But there was a lot of depth in the group that we had, so it couldn't be as basic as you might sometimes have it in 
less talented groups or more top heavy groups, shall I say. So, you know, it's, it's, it's tournament basketball at the end of the day. So you do your work in the summer in terms of building your principles and getting things right according to how your national uh, governing body wants it to be for the selectors. But once it's time to play, it's time to play. And that was when it came to tournament time, my focus in terms of making sure the right people were on the court at the right times. Um, and also having worked on developing parts of the offense as well uh, during the, the summer practice programs. And then in 2017, I got the opportunity to head coach the under 17 girls program, which was uh, a very different situation. Uh, there's generally throughout the country, fewer girls at that age group. Anyway, then you have fewer girls that are heading towards what you would consider to be elite. So having a recruiter's hat on in terms of actually getting the roster it was um, uh, like it was a two-edged sword where I was very aware that, oh my goodness, a lot of these kids are from my club. What is going on? So I had to get over that. You know, it's not my fault. It is what it is. Just take, who, take what is there and work with it. And we had a very extensive uh, summer program. Uh, we really took hold of the principles that were given to us um, according to the British principles of play. And when it came to the tournament time, I think, you know, the girls performed in a way that would have impressed a lot of people. Um, but unfortunately, you know, at that time, unfortunately for the girls at that time, there was a pretty deep national team cohort, which meant that only one of them was able to be invited to camp afterwards, which was Chloe Andrew. Um, but, you know, figuring out how to run a program in that situation for that purpose, again, tournament play, um, was a a very enjoyable experience for me. So now moving on to more, you're, you're transitioning from coaching boys to girls, isn't it? And you had a lot more opportunities working with girls programs. Um, also another one was Basketball Wells, correct? Yes. Um, I got involved with Basketball Wells. Goodness gracious me, I'm trying to get my years correct here. 2018-19? Um, <laughs> So, excuse me, 2018-19 um, with the Wales under-14 girls. Um, listen, uh, I went down there with this impression that oh, it's going to be pretty bad. It's going to be pretty bad. Um, that's what I was thinking. You know, you don't hear a lot. You don't see a lot about uh, basketball in Wales in the first place, girls' basketball in particular. And it had been a long time since I'd actually been in Welsh basketball since I left uni. But getting down there, I was pleasantly surprised with, A, how many kids showed up to trials. And while they were not great, they weren't awful. And there were one or two that I looked at, I was like, okay, you might have something here. And I took an approach where I'm not necessarily trying to build a team here. I'm trying to uh, lay the foundations for the beginnings of an overall program where, you know, you're feeding the pyramid going up. So I didn't actually cut anybody. At under 14, you know, again, we it's already uh, a smaller pool than you get maybe with the boys anyway. And um, even the girls were probably a little bit further behind their peers it was only going to benefit them from being within that group and doing the same things, competing with that group. Um, you know, so that's the approach I took it. I took with it, but unfortunately, obviously, as time went on, circumstances meant that I couldn't actually finish the project, which is you know, a, a very large shame. 
and you know something that I'd I'd love to one day be able to correct. There's a lot of potential and growth um, in the Welsh in in Wales basketball anyway, but particularly at the lower end of the girls program. You know, I'm I'm very enthusiastic for what they have going forward. Well, it definitely must have uh, grown by then as well. So the talent pool must be bigger now. Um, you probably saw it from the start um, of the foundations of, of building that under-14s national. Um, going back to actually a previous question um, or previous discussion, you said, you know, your assistant coach role uh, um, for the, I think it was the boys basketball England, correct? Um, you mentioned about your role strategically sub you know doing the subs substitutes um how did you come up with a plan for this i mean um is it is it regimented are you quite strict with it do you stick with it on the game plan is it or is it um that you of course as the game goes on um, is it based on fatigue is it actually just general squad rotation uh, these are good points for for coaches looking in yeah, um, a lot of it was actually um, directed um, in consultation with the head coach, as you'd expect. You know, this, there's no way I'm going to be able to dictate the way substitution has happened to the head coach. But the initial responsibility for sort of figuring out, like, according to the depth chart that we've been working on throughout the summer, figuring out who plays how long, in what spots, um, the combinations, um, and ultimately why you're substituting players. You know, there's, there was a lot of work that went into it. Now, obviously, fatigue is a key one to consider. You, you don't want to leave anyone out there for longer than they need to be in a certain stretch because then you get some diminishing returns. You know, the temptation is always to leave your best players on the court. But then, again, that comes down to having the right combinations of players on the court where I might withdraw my strongest offensive player, for instance, my biggest scorer. But then, by doing that, you're replacing him with a combination of players that are maybe a bit more sound defensively as a group. So while you lose his offensive output, you're not scoring as much. Maybe with the next group, you're really slowing down the other team's offensive output to where really by balance, you've not lost the scoring because it's not being affected in the way you would imagine say, losing 15 points on the floor would be. So that was a key consideration. And it was fluid. If it came to a situation where um, one of the guys who started on the bench was really performing well, and, you know, we could afford to give them extended minutes, we would. Obviously, that means the other guy suffers for their minutes. But from an overall perspective, you're getting solid production throughout your bench and your roster, and also the, mor the morale of the guy getting additional minutes only benefits you going forward. So it's, it's not the easiest thing to do to figure out this kind of stuff. Like I said, the temptation is just to have your five best players on the court, but you also have to consider the combinations. Your five best players may well be all bigs, for instance. Mm -hmm. Is that going to work? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Um, so you, you really have to know the group that you're working with, um, figure out how you want to play in different situations, in different spots, have different lineups for different situations. Yes. Because, um, you know, your depth chart isn't just um, best player at the one, second best player at the one, best player at the two, so on and so forth. You know, you've got your starting lineup, your bench lineup. Uh, your defensive lineup, your, your lineup when you need shooting, your lineup when the other team plays on, your lineup when you're pressing. There's a million different scenarios you can go with. Yes. And figuring that out, you know, is, you know, it's, it's a fun part of uh, coaching those types of teams.
Mm. Especially, I mean, if you've got 12 to 50 guys that are exceptionally talented, um, you definitely have a little more, uh, a lot more, I would say, uh, creativity in a way to to build up these different lineups, especially if they all can fulfil that role. And at that level, I can I, I can imagine that they do. Um, going, I was actually going to go to your previous point that you mentioned. Um, for example, in practices, would you have like a team A, team B? Would you build that chemistry up with the, the second string and the first string? Uh, just so when they're on the court in certain situations, they're familiar with people? Or uh, was that kind of an, an implementation in a way from the coaches uh, that this is going to be the first string, second string? This is what some mentalities of coaches and they implement into their, their team. Was that kind of it? Or was it more like um, we're going to define the different dynamics? Players will mix with, with certain players at different points in the and the game, which, you know, will happen, but ultimately uh, we're going to see how the game goes and unfolds. Um, what's, your, what's your views on that, Coach? Um, the way we did it then, which is very much uh, the way um, I took and did it this previous season with Lancashire Spinners, is that, um, yes, we did have those core groups, which you would call, you know, the starters and maybe your bench. Mm and mixtures of the two. And we did a lot of that. We did a lot of that. But what we'd also do is sort of we'd mix and match the groups according to what we needed from that practice or that segment of practice where, you know, if we needed to work on breaking a press, for example, we'd have probably one team that was... Um, packed with our better defensive players and they would be the ones running the press for these guys to sort of try and work against um, to sort of get more bang for your dollar in that situation and you, you, you try and have different uh, groups with different scenarios in practice um, take a couple of your better players from your starting group and three of your players from the lower end of the rotation and make that a team. Go leave, you know, put them in that situation where, you know, you're, you're up against it, you're trying to fight against the scoreboard where we've, get, we've artificially given you a seven point deficit to try and play in four minutes, uh, you know, that type of thing. So there's, there's a lot of ways you can do it, especially in practice. Mm -hmm. You've got ultimate control in practice in terms of that kind of stuff. So play around with it a little bit, um, mix it up, but definitely chemistry counts. So you do want to have reps with certain groups that you're going to be relying on. Mm -hmm. And also don't be afraid to put guys in weird situations. Do you know what I mean? Um, for instance, like, something we did a little bit of is just have your five man bring the ball down the floor and see how the other team responds to that. It's a strange thing to see happening, but it might, it might pop up in the game at some point. How are we going to respond? I agree. I mean, I put players in, you know, like as you mentioned, the top players, or say the core players on the team, mix them up with the, say, the third string or the, 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 the players on 11th and 12th spot. Um, it never usually goes well because, again, you actually see their leadership skills, a bit of their character building as well, because it, they would have to have a lot more patience and they get quite frustrated. It's quite funny looking back at the time, you know, they get really frustrated. Um, but like you said, it's different scenarios that could happen, not just from your opposition, but actually in your team. You never know in a game, you know, foul troubles things can happen and that these players might actually be on the court with you at one point, especially at crucial time. So they need to adjust to that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, again, it comes down to knowing your group. Like I'm very aware that in certain scenarios, say we wanted to run a certain type of um, full court press or trapping situation. There's certain players in our group that I wouldn't imagine having on the floor in that situation for different reasons. Mm. Um, so you figure it out through playing these scenarios in your practice. Mm. Uh, and that's literally what it is. It's, 
I wouldn't call it a rehearsal as such, but it's not far from it because, you know, once the lights turn on and the ref's throwing the ball up, they've got to go and do it. I've never done this before, coach. Damn, that's my fault. Yeah, you're right. Yes. It's, it's, it's all about, uh, with my players, I always take accountability. Um, they find it strange. Um, but I always see it as um, it's my fault. For example, if a player takes a bad shot, I feel like that's my fault. Because at, at that time, they're in a position where I didn't prepare them to take that shot. And I haven't prepared them in a way fundamentally and through sessions to be ready for that shot. And that's what some players look at me and say, coach, that's, that's my bad. I said, that's fine. But again, ultimately, it's all about preparing. I feel as a coach, we watch game tape, you know, we prepare as much as we can, you know, hours of game tape, you know, statistics, um, understanding their patterns, their behaviors, uh, to prepare them for what we what we call battle, isn't it? Um, for example, as you made a clear good point on full court press, if one of my guys is not in position on the full court press, that's my fault. Yeah, because I do, I haven't coached him and prepared him to to understand this is my philosophy. We're going to press. This is my system. We're going to press here. But he's he may have forgotten. But I see it as it's my role as a coach to make sure he's in the best position to succeed. Do you see what I mean, Coach? Yeah, and I try to take a very similar approach to it as you do, but there's slight differences in the way I do mm. it. Um, for example, like I said, if a player takes a bad shot. Now, yes, there's objectively good and bad shots, of course, in basketball, but mm. something I've tried to train myself to think instead is, was there a better shot? Yes. Imagine this scenario. We've tried really good defense. They're rotating very well, moving the ball, 5 4 3 two, one. He chucks it up. Bad shot. Could we have had a better shot? Probably not. So yes. you kind of take uh, the L on that one. Um, of I mean, it's. Instead of looking at, mm. Sorry, go on. No, go on, go on, go on. So instead of looking at that shot in itself as being a bad shot, in my mind, I'm going back to the possession as a whole and why could we not generate a better shot than, than what we got um, and while the idea is that a good offense will be a good defense yes the the whole point of having a defense there is by the way not to stop you from scoring to, if, once you start understanding that things get a little bit easier as a defensive mm. player your job as a defender is to be as disruptive as you can. Yes. Right? Because, again, like I said, good offense should be good defense. Offense mm. is in control. They've got the ball. So how do I deal with how disruptive the defense were able to be to the point that we only got the last second heave up at the basket as opposed to the bad shot itself? The bad shot was necessary. Otherwise, we get nothing from that possession. You know what I mean? And the other thing that that I learned, and this was um, back in 2017-18 with the girls at Manchester Mystics, I learned to change my thinking from thinking of faults to thinking of responsibility. Um, Say we're in the game, Clive, and you turn the ball over. Everybody who's got half a brain cell in the building knows that it was your fault. I don't need to tell you that. But now it becomes our collective responsibility as a team to not allow them to break on us and get an easy layup, 1v0, and take advantage of the fact that we came up with an empty possession. So once you change the thinking in that way from fault to responsibility, when things are focused on fault, I'm pointing my finger at you, I'm shouting at you, I'm frustrated with you. If I'm focused on responsibility, I don't have time to be frustrated because I've got another job to do after that. So that's, you know, certain things had to happen within the girls program for us to approach that point. Um, Obviously, that on in a vacuum, you'd rather these things didn't happen. But 
for the better, it led to, you know, improved way of framing these situations. I mean, as you mentioned, um, I think previously when we had discussions, um, basketball court is there for players to make mistakes, isn't it? Uh, the more mistakes they make in a way will make them better players. Um, no one's perfect, you know. Um, and I think that's where the coaching aspect comes in, is how do we portray this message? How do we get this across in the way that we um, communicate and, the, and, and break it down to the way they understand? And I think that's really important because, as you said, there's different ways to communicate this. It could be frustration. It could be shouting. It could be this. Uh, whatever way you, you, you as a coach, that's your style. Um, but the most important is the message, isn't it? And yeah, if they could... The message is, is always key because, like, just to oversimplify it, for instance, um, back to the turnover scenario I just presented you, immediately as it happens, Clive, that was garbage. But yes, I know the other team had the ball. I can see that. Yeah. What do you want me to do right now? Can I go and do the thing? Or do you want to talk about it? <laughs> yes, in practice, we can stop the game, stop the scrimmage, whatever, and talk about what happened. But we don't need to talk about the fact that it was garbage because we know that mm. already. Right? <laughs> so what we talk about there is, okay, you're probably nine times out of ten the first person to know that a turnover is going to happen when it comes from you. It will take everyone else, you know, a few tenths of a second more to realize what is happening or anticipate. Mm. I throw a bad pass. I'm going to be the first person to see, oh, no, that guy's about to cut it off. Forget the fact that I've literally just given the other team the ball for a second and how I feel about that and immediately switch to doing something about it, right? That's focusing on responsibility. Focusing on faults is, I throw the bad pass, I see the guy about to cut it off. Oh no. What was <laughs> oh no doing for us in this moment in time? You know, so and that's, that's the way to look at it. I think um, very, very interesting points, Coach, and I agree. Um, there's points where I've heard coaches, you know, some coaches say, they don't even tell their players to box out because they think it's a waste of just energy and just telling them box out, box out, because they work on it and practice all the time. Um, instead, they'll give directions to their players on the next play. So they're wait, using that energy instead of just reminding them and, and shouting at them for doing little things that they should be doing anyway. I mean, I sometimes, I'll be honest, I shout at my players to box out. Uh, because I feel like it might re remind them <laughs> if it just gets in their head. But then again, some coaches feel that's not, you don't need to do that because it, it, it's, it should be basic knowledge for them. They should understand that. What's your points on that? Yeah. I don't really know how I feel about that one, but I can understand the logic. Mm. Um, so I know that my style during the game is... I don't like directing possessions as they happen. Mm. Like, I can scream a million things at you right now, Clive, and they'll go in one ear and out the other, or you mm. just don't hear me for whatever reason. Yeah. Because there's a lot of different things going on around you that you have to deal with in real time. Yeah. So I try and stay away from that. But I do, a lot of this is that I will kind of reflect you know quickly two three seconds on that previous possession hey man don't turn that shot down you're wide open as yeah. opposed to when the ball came to you at the time shoot well maybe you're off balance maybe you saw something i didn't from your yeah. perspective so me screaming shoot isn't very helpful yeah. but after taking in the possession and seeing what actually occurred you know i can you know just try at least to provide some quick feedback to say there's no reason to turn that down. So yeah. the next time you're in that situation, you've prepared before the ball even arrives to you or you're more confident or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing specifically about boxing out is I feel like sometimes, especially if you've just had a game where you were bullied on the boards, there's a temptation to jump into practice and drill rebounding it's the most 
difficult thing to isolate and draw, I think, in terms of um, a particular event, because the more artificial you make it, the less useful it is in terms of rebounding and boxing up. Mm -hmm. You know, what you're going to do is you're going to place players in particular spots that they're going to be arriving from, and it's predictable. Um, the rebounding and boxing out scenario in basketball is one of the most unpredictable that you can kind of imagine. Um, all predicated on where the offensive spacing has left players, all predicated on how your defensive rotations have left you. So instead of actually drilling the event, drill the skill or emphasize the skill, say to your players, I don't care what happens after this, but when you see this ball leave this guy's hands, turn your head nearest person, put your forearm in their chest and mm -hmm. make sure they can't run to the basket. You know, and keep scoring that. Make notes. Okay, that possession, three people failed to hit anybody. And whatever you, you measure in terms of keeping track of who is and isn't doing these things, you can now emphasize three of you fail to box out on that possession, I'm going to punish you on the scoreboard and we're going to run whatever it is. Now you're delivering the message in a different way. So not boxing out is literally a loss on the scoreboard because they gained a point or you lost one as opposed to, ah, oh, damn, I just didn't get the ball that time. You know, so instead of wasting time isolating um, rebounding repetitions artificially because... It's unpredictable. Yes. Maybe you can do it in a different way where you're, you're emphasizing the important aspects of it. I agree, coach. I think very, very good points. Um, as you mentioned, the game is unpredictable. You know, um, it, it's, you see the usual rebound drills, but does it, again, it's hard to imitate a game scenario because one, the players know that the shot is going to miss anyway, and and two, they might not be in the right positions that they um that they will be in the game, as you said. Um, it's hard to also kind of predict offenses again in say the next plays because the defense, your oppositions may adjust, isn't it? They they they're going to adjust, and like you said, um, you never know. You might have the five bring up the ball or, or you know, they might go to a full court press. These are things which are, I think, where the coaching really comes in and understanding and through experience, when you coach more games and coach against uh, top coaches who, who have strong IQs, this is where your strategic approaches come in and where you can really adjust your style of coaching and really understand um, uh, the game a lot more on that level. I think um, what you mentioned about putting players aside three, four seconds, especially, I don't know, if, if there's free throws and stuff, and just kind of making them realise, um, okay, there is a better shot in the corner. Oh, yes, that was a bad shot, but, you know, look at your different options next time. Um, don't pick up your dribble so quickly. These are little things, like you said, is helping push the message. Would you agree? Yeah, and... Practice isn't just for the players, it's for the coaches too. Nice. And, you know, that's, that's where you kind of develop your system of communication as a coach mm -hmm. as well, where, uh, again, you're able to do this and sometimes you need to do this where you stop practice to say something mm -hmm. and make adjustment or something. But being able to communicate on the fly, one, two seconds and no more, is very important because, you know, while I'm talking to you, play's happening. It's not every time the ball's dead that you're, you're going to wait to communicate. Sometimes mm. you have to do it as play's happening. It's true. It's so true. something quick, like I've got <laughs> uh, a weird dynamic that actually developed while I was in Mystics is some of the players wouldn't respond to their names because they got so used to the sound of me whistling. So, you know, when, when you call their name, that could be anybody calling their name. You say, for example, I call Clive, Clive, Clive. Then I whistle, oh, and what? <laughs> so when the whistle, they knew that was me. Yeah. For, for certain. But that was kind of how 
unintentionally I developed our system of communication <laughs> that way in practice. So because the you know you can tell the difference between you know a game whistle like like a coach or referee has and your more analog whistle with your mouth. You you'll hear the difference between those. So I'd used my natural whistle where I didn't want to stop everybody, but I wanted that person's attention in practice. And it built the muscle memory amongst those girls to listen out for it and respond to that a lot more than they responded to their own names and mm. name situations. So things like that where, I don't know, different people for have different things, hand signals. I use some hand signals as well. Um, Nonverbal communication, a look a nod, whatever it is, you develop that in your practice as much as the players are developing their own skills and their own muscle memory. And and I love it because it's it's what makes coaching in my eyes. These little things, you know, the, the relationship, the, the building of that, that partnership in a way with the players, um, having that communication and you know you can understand each other on that level because that's what the in a way the game of basketball brings is that you're, you're seeing it together, you're communicating together, and then you're achieving things together, which I think is a, uh, a, 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 a good recipe. I see you smiling. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, you just reminded me of a conversation I had with a, a friend, colleague about this. It's like, um, bear with me, because this is going to sound really weird. <laughs> if you've ever watched Guardians of the Galaxy, right? Yes. Uh-huh. Um, the character group, says only three words ever i am Groot. yeah but they always mean something different because if the understanding is if you know groups knowing the way he's saying it the context everything it makes sense <laughs> yeah it's true it's actually so very true it could be something that i i had during free throws once during a game and this is honestly no word of a lie um, it was a playoff quarterfinal, um, Mystics against Sony in 2018, uh, 2018-19. I had literally a full conversation with one of my players who was on the floor, and neither of us said a single word. But we we clearly both understood each other with, you know, some some gestures, some looks, a little mm. bit of pointing. We had a full conversation while these free throws were being administered without a word being said. And you know, that 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 kind of thing can happen when you build that dynamic and you build your system of communication and you know each other. Um, so. that's it's very true it's like a la- it is a language in itself isn't it <laughs> uh, that yeah, that kind of communication some, looking at the silent would have thought what is that crazy guy over there doing what is wrong with him yeah don't worry about it she got it um, so I coached uh, this player I've actually got a story about that I coached this player called um, Attila so shout out Atti um, probably one of the best scorers that we've had at the University of Westminster but there'll be times where he takes bad shots but he'll just look at me with the with the sh- um, when he does something really bad he knows that my eyes are kind of drilling at him at the back of his head so he knows he knows that that was a bad shot coach is going to look at me but I just give him a look like this and he and he'll just look at me and we'll just have a stare off for probably like 10 seconds. And then he'll just run back. Knowing that it was a bad shot, I don't need to tell him that it was a bad shot, that he needs to do better. And the next play, he'll take a better shot. And he'll be, or he'll, he'll play, he'll make a better play. So to me, it's nice because, as you said, sometimes you don't have to say it. It's just through signals and through your body. Um, and I think it's that relationship. I mean, I coached him for three years. So he was, a, he was an interesting character, Atti. Um, <laughs> very, very fun to coach. Um, and it was just interesting because it's how you deal with these uh, different characters, isn't it? I think yeah. is what makes it a coach. Tone, tone and intonation as well. I mean, a, a great deal when you communicate with someone. Like, I'll give you a phrase right now. I'm going to say it two different ways. And it's going to mean two different things. And if you want me to explain them, I will, but you'll probably get it. So you just made a play, right? Is that what we're doing? How do you feel about that one? 
okay, now you just made a play. Is that what we're doing? Two very different messages. Mm. Now, which yes. one was the good one? Which one was the bad one? Um, I would say the second one is a good one. The no, first one's so the bad if, one. If, so, so the second one for me, is that what we're doing? So I don't know if I can explain it properly. The fact that I just emphasize the that in the sentence, mm. I'm looking at what you just did. But in the first one, if I say, is that what we're doing? I'm emphasizing okay. the result of what just happened. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's the, the tone, isn't it? Um, yeah, the same phrase, two different scenarios, two mm. different meanings. And, you know, people get this, you know, when they're together for long enough and they know each other well. Enough. Yes, yes. And I can say to you something after, after you do or say something and be like, really? Or you do or say mm. something, I'm like, really? <laughs> exactly exactly and and that's the thing it's part of your personality is and the players definitely understand that for sure um so again i think we haven't actually even touched on uh, some of the stuff i think you you mentioned about manchester mystics and under 16s and under 18s um speak a bit more about how was it like working with those programs you, you did touch on some stories before yeah um very key part of my development um coaching the Mystics Junior program. Um, just because of the nature of uh, this, the way girls basketball is at the under 16 and under 18 age group is very amalgamated. Um, the groups work together on the practice floor at least. And there's a lot of crossover as well, 16s into 18s playing up and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, this is where I probably had to be um, at my most versatile as a coach. Like I said, you're dealing with up to 24 different personalities that we had in the group. Different levels of development, different uh, skill levels, different ambitions. And being able to cater to everybody as required that's why it was so important that we actually did have as many coaches as we did. i say one, at one time, four of us, the least we ever had was three. Um, and each of us bringing something incredibly different to the last person in terms of the dynamic um, and our roles and responsibilities. Whereas, you know, I was probably the more macro guy looking at things overall but also the most technical and tactical amongst us. Um, whereas, like I, I mentioned Natalie before, she's very uh, good with the, the players, pastorally, uh, emotional support, and still contributes a lot in terms of basketball coaching. Mm. And we had uh, Joe Andrew as well, who he brought, uh, amongst us, he was the only parent. He was the only parent in the group. So he brought that dynamic and understanding of that um, uh, relationship um, with those children that are, we are responsible for for up to ten hours a week, you know, uh, in practice, in games, travel to games, etc. You know, so he brought that perspective as well in terms of also. Um, he had an incredible work ethic and valued work ethic in the kids and brought that to them. He emphasized that to them. Um, so being able to look at what girls basketball was, what I thought it should be, where I thought it was going at the time that I made the crossover from boys basketball was um, pretty good timing actually because it was just at the exact time where things were starting to take off in the, in the country overall in terms of girls basketball. In terms of competition, how did you guys do? Uh, well, uh, managed domestics in general will always have, always have been and always will be one of the the top end programs in the country in terms of um, achieving results, if you want to look at it that way. 
Um, let's look at what happened to the under 16s um, in the time I was with Manchester Mystics. Won two league titles, um, but never made it further than quarterfinals in the playoffs. Under 18s. Uh, made Final Fours twice, making the final once. But in the way I personally look at it, that probably didn't actually matter because um, these girls are learning how to, you know, compete in high-level basketball, particularly the 16s playing up in 18s. You know, the team, the under-18 team that made um, the national final in 2018-19 was pretty much 50-50 actual under-18s and under-16s playing up. So, you know, the kind of experience they were able to glean from that will obviously stand in a good stead going forward. Um, you know, had kids representing the national team programs from that group kids going off to play in, in the States from that group. Uh, and of course, <laughs> probably the most overlooked thing in all of this is they, there are some, I, I would dare to say, lifelong friends in that group that they made. You know, just from playing basketball. And the amount of time these kids spend together, particularly at that club, is, is pretty crazy. You know, it's almost like another extra member of your family that you're seeing every time you walk into this building. And then outside of that, they spend time together as well. They're always on their phones communicating. And we often overlook that as we talk about, you know, basketball and stuff because we're always thinking of the scoreboard or, or the award at the end of the season. It's, it's bigger than basketball, isn't it, coach? I mean, um, it's great to see the the way your career has evolved because remember at the start of the of our conversation when we were talking about the programs you were working with, you said uh, you wish more, you wish they did more the programs that you worked with that, you know, it wasn't just about winning games, you know, and, that, and, and as you said now, um, coming up to the latter part of your career, um, you're actually looking a lot more on that side, you know, which is fantastic. And um, it's easy to get. I remember when I jumped into coaching, it's just about, you know, win loss. You know, we need to win. We need to win. Um, but then I understand as soon as you become a coach, um, the actual responsibilities that I have, not just as a basketball coach to these people, but as a mentor someone that they'll remember for the rest of their lives and I think that's really important in guiding them and helping them because those decisions that they make at that age can be very significant in where they actually end up in like five six years so it's I think it's a very um very in, in terms of what you mentioned with that that squad it's nice to see that they are developed that bond and, and that you actually had an impact on that on their part of their career um so you worked on Bucks uh, for a bit. I think you uh, you worked at the University of Manchester uh, with Coach Case, but I think you were more involved with the men's program. Um, going from all these national league um, and coaching at the national level as well, Bucks must have been a bit of an eye opener, I say, in terms of quality, but uh, and in terms of you know resources and trainings because it's not as uh, I would say as focused as those other leagues that you've been coaching. Speak more about your box experience. Yeah, uh, my time with the University of Manchester actually was, while I was doing it, was concurrent with the work I was doing with the Mystics. So, you know, I was never detached from that. Um, but, you know, with uh, Case and myself, uh, I was the men's first team head coach. He was the women's head coach. But, the dynamic and the relationship that we have actually meant that there wasn't really that kind of delineation in practical terms. But, um, I was able to help him with uh, some of the stuff that he needed help with. He was able to help me with some of the stuff that I needed help with. Um, you know, we were able to provide each other with, you know, 
pretty honest and objective uh, perspective about what each and the other was doing, good and bad. And um, I actually really enjoyed my time um, at the university. You know, the group we had was a particularly talented group. Um, two junior Irish internationals tagging Keen Hickey. Um, and I had one guy literally fall out of heaven into my lap out of uh, NCAA Division Three, who'd come over to do his master's, that I had nothing to do with him being there in the first place, but he just happened to be there. So was that, that was that was that Graham Gilleran? Uh, Graham Gilleran. <laughs> he, he was a, a very very good addition to the program. He brought a lot of experience. He's actually <laughs> um, part of the coaching team at his alma mater. Um, Amazing. In, in the United States. So he obviously has a basketball brain. And there were a lot of um, young guys in the team. Uh, the youngest guy in the team that year, uh, Jean, Jean Kayumba, he was literally the baby of the team. And I went to see them uh, this past season play in Bucks and you know, seeing how he's grown both physically and his role within the program. He's definitely no longer the baby of the team. He's a very <laughs> key part of what they, they were able to achieve. And it was nice to see that growth that he had. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still basketball. And you have to approach it as such. Like, um, planning is everything. You know, you know the kind of hours that you've been offered in terms of contact time. You have to make the most of that whether you've got you know 10 hours or you only have two hours figure it out figure out there's different ways to sort of uh, apply your delivery to maximize your time and you can always do more coaching isn't just when you're in the gym on the floor with your players it's what you're doing outside of that you know looking at game tape um sort of reviewing your own practices and stuff like that. Uh, and that's a big thing for me, like filming practices and looking back and seeing uh, what, what did I miss or what could I have done better or just to sort of isolate certain parts of that practice to, to show back in terms of what it was they were trying to achieve, that type of thing. So, yeah, and as a result of that, I've stayed connected um, informally to the University of Manchester program. Um, and the people within it, not least of which is Case. And the funny thing, oh, I had a smile on my face watching his episode on here the other day uh, mm -hmm. when you were talking about them winning uh, the, the league this past season. Mm -hmm. Because, um, just because of my schedule and everything, I hadn't been able to watch them at all. And it just so happened that day was the first time I was free to go and watch them play. Um, and as I was sat on the opposite sideline, while the game's going on, he just shouts, Greg, Greg, what? Come in. Like, what? Game's over. No, no. Come around to the baseline. Okay. Don't know what's going on here. Oh, so, so past the baseline, um, it, that's no longer part of the bench. So I, the people can be sat or stood there. So referees couldn't have done too much to me. But he walks over. And as he's walking over, he says, we've done it. I'm lost. I don't know what you're talking about, Michael. He said, we've done it. Sheffield lost. He hit me. I was like, what? Sheffield lost? Yeah. That means you've won the league. Yeah. And, like, it meant so much to him. He kind of, he was breaking down a little bit because, you know, it's been a very long journey for him in that program, I think four years now. And he's seen both ends of the spectrum from being successful to being not so successful to bouncing back through divisions to where they are now. And, you know, it was an emotional moment for him and I was really, really happy that, you know, I just happened to be there at that moment to share that with him. And I think you showed in the video clip mm. how I'm on the baseline giving him a, a pretty big hug. And 
you know, for me, that was, it was sincerely heartfelt, you know, and I was really, really proud of him in that moment, having seen everything that, you know, he's had to deal with and had to cope with in terms of finally arriving at that point. Sounds like you've had a, a great experience with the university, which is nice to hear because, um, yeah, I think box is an underrated league. You probably heard me speak about it in previous podcasts. I think that the talent level that comes through, um, people will be very surprised. For example, Graham, I don't know if you've actually heard the story, but me and him were in contact with each other uh, before he came to the UK. Um, he was actually interested in studying at Westminster. He, he had he received uh, an exception into a master's program at Westminster, um, but he chose Manchester to study, which I'm very happy for because the most important is that he got his master's degree. And he told me that he's actually, you know, still involved with the game and he's he's um, now doing big things and and continuing his career after studies uh which to me is the more, always the most important thing so it's nice to know that you actually coached him i didn't know that <laughs> coach greg so it's nice to see that he he excelled because from what when we were speaking i knew he was going to be a good talent and i remember speaking to case before as well uh speaking about him and i said yeah uh, we spoke during the summer um and uh, we talked about his game and what he wanted to do. So it's nice he achieved that at Manchester and, and you were, he was actually coached under you, which is great to hear. Um, also, the story in the previous episode with Case, as you, as you mentioned, um, there was that big video of you guys embracing and it was actually really nice to see. Um, and that's how you know it's more than basketball, which is, which is great. And as Coach Case mentioned at the time, he was also going through some personal issues um, and some personal problems which which was a quite you know it was a relief in a way that it was it was it all came together for him at that moment and it was yeah. it looked like a, a a really as I mentioned it as, as I call it a defining moment because it was nice to see and very very um, I was very happy for him yeah it was it was a moment of, uh, of catharsis for him you know it was a release where you know, I think sometimes I, he he sort of sells himself a little bit short in terms of how much he actually does because he does a lot more than is necessary. And, you know, when you're a workaholic, it's easy to sort of overlook that. But, you know, if you're someone that comes and watches the games and that's all you see, that's all you know. But if you look at all the stuff he does in the background, you know, the, the extra stuff that he does is, it's, it's, it's a lot more than you can ask someone in this position to do. And, you know, being there for that previously and having seen it and knowing him and knowing his approach to it meant that I was able to appreciate that in a different way when it finally happened. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what it actually felt like on my end, but it was, it was very good just to see, just to see that kind of relief because I, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty certain at one point he must've felt it was never going to happen for them. You know, as he explained, there was just that moving roadblock permanently, I suppose, off of Sheffield Helen, always in the way, and finally being able to get over that hump. Um, at the time it happened with the, you know, the conversion of all these events in his personal life and that um, finally getting over the Sheffield Hallam hump and finally getting over the, the league title in the, the tier one all came together at the same time, at the right time for him. That's great to hear, Coach. Um, and it's even more better to hear the positive and the, the, the words that you say for him because he was my coach at Westminster. And one thing, as I, I always remember, he always had time. And that's the thing he always gives to his programs, his players, is the time. And as you said, there's a lot of coaches I've met, you know, that will do the hours, clock in, clock out, I'm done, you know. 
but as you mentioned on on top points uh, that you mentioned coaching is not just what you do on the basketball court it's what you uh, what you do off the basketball court and you, you take on aside from the roles that you do on the court and you continue to do that off of the court you know like the extra work and coach case represents that um, and it's part of building a true winning program i believe not not just winning as in winning records and winning championships but the way that the players reflect on you which i mentioned to him as well i could see that the players have the utmost respect i mean they they were just as proud of their coach as they you know as he is a, as a proud of them in a way um but yeah, it's, it was really, really good. And it's nice that you established that relationship. I mean, you guys are doing a podcast, which you will shout out after as well together. So it's nice that, um, as you mentioned, with the players, that, with, the under, with the girls that you've coached, they build that bond as players. But coaches, they build a bond too, which is, which is always, always yeah, good. Yeah, and <laughs> um, I've got so much respect for a lot of the people especially the unpaid people in the game because um i mentioned my colleague joe andrew previously that i worked with at manchester mystics and as i said he was the only parent in our group there was one time where um we had uh what would be looked at as a key game in the league a few years ago, 2017-18, against Haringey Angels. Um, it was a home game, thankfully. So what he did wasn't as difficult to do, but it's still like a huge sacrifice. Um, he missed his youngest daughter's fourth birthday to be at the game with me coaching. Um, wow. Knowing that... Um, um, our other colleagues were just unavailable. They weren't in town to be able to to help me out in the game. So he literally, he missed his his daughter, youngest daughter's fourth birthday to be there at the game with me. And he did this, obviously, to help me, but also for the girls more than anything, because at that time, you know, it was it was a crucial time for the for the program and the girls themselves with the things that were happening, you know. Um, there was a big paradigm shift that was happening in the program at the time. So being able to offer them the maximum of support we could at every opportunity was important for us to do. And he, he took that decision upon himself to be there. So you know, that, that goes and said a lot of the time, but it's definitely something that I recognize. And it's powerful, you know, when you look back at stories such as that, coaches, their passion for the game and, and that, that relationship you build with the players and more importantly, what he's built with you as a coach, you know, like uh, just shows what coaches will do for their team and for the love of the game, which is which is great to see. Um, yeah, and players are teammates. Coaches are teammates with each other as well. Um, yes, yes. There's a video from a moment in in that 2017-18 season. Um, the under-18 girls playoff quarterfinal in Reading at Reading, uh, where the final buzzer sounds and the girls all rush onto the court and hug each other, and the extra girls from off the court that had uh, traveled down as well, rush to celebrate. And in the video, quietly in the background, there's the three of us coaches in the background and uh, we just quietly um, embracing a bit of a group hug at the end of the game. Um, because that was at that moment in time, obviously more to be done as you progress, but in that moment in time, it was kind of the culmination of what was ultimately a difficult season um, with everything that had happened uh, and sort of recognition of what each one of us had sort of done on the path to get here. And just also relief that we're able to watch these girls have that moment in the midst of everything. It's just the, the ultimate sacrifice, isn't it, for the for the 
for the goal, all the, the would you say, like the blood, sweat and tears that go into coaching as well as the players, all the efforts that they've done, it all comes collectively into that one moment. It's, it's kind of indescribable in a way, isn't it? It's that feeling that you get. Um, but it sounds, again, it's what makes true teams it's the collaboration, the actual working together for that ultimate goal. I think that's what defines, in a way, the success of a basketball club. Um, not just, again, winning is, is of course, uh, a clear goal for, for teams, but it's about how you win, I always say. It's the process of you winning, you know, uh, because um, I've, I've seen programmes that win, um, and the players go on to do other things and, and they probably don't even appreciate the time that they had because it was just so kind of, in a way, systematic. It was just so focused on basketball, whereas some people forget to enjoy the process and have fun in it. Um, and when you can build a program which kind of has a mix of both, I think you definitely are winning you know, on and off the court. Yeah, um, and you have to look at it for what it is, really, you know. Um, you coach these kids, especially at the junior level, like 90% of them aren't really going to do much more than that uh, going past that point. And with that being the case, it can't just be about the scoreboard. You can't, yes. of course, yes. play in the team sport, competitive sport, and a relatively high level just by the standard of the country, you know? So you want to be successful, you want to win. But it can't be win at all costs. It can't be the be all and end all. And, you know, those groups start to mean something to each other. Uh, we had a moment at the end of the under-18 player final in 2018-19 against Southern Pride. And, you know, for a lot of people in that group, players and coaches, uh, there was an unspoken realization that this was going to be the last time we are all together as a group. It's a final, it's the last game of the season. And after the season, a lot of people are going their separate ways, whether it's the kids that are now too old or people heading off in their own direction for whatever reason or whatever the reason may be. And as the game ended, um, I'd say a minute and a half left in the game, um, I've cleared the bench as, you know, so it's not, not to say you, you accept defeat, but you, you have to acknowledge when the task is out of hand. So, like, you know, the, the players that wouldn't normally see court time in a close competitive end of game scenario uh, put them on the floor and while that's happening I'm acknowledging um, each player as they come off the floor um, as a sort of well done for one come on you lose a final you're still in there to be able to lose it you know only one team was better than you um, and in the post game, as presentations are happening with medals and everything, um, you can see it's on it's in the video on YouTube of the final. The emotional release from the players and myself, uh, even though I'm not uh, as prone to cry as your average person, I just something that doesn't happen. Um, I don't like being around it normally, but I was more receptive of it at that moment because I understood what it meant. And I knew that that was my last game with that group ever, anybody in that group, because regardless of, I didn't know that I was going to be leaving the club for one. I didn't know that, but I knew I wasn't going to be with that age group because I wanted a different challenge, even within the club, if I had I stayed. So, you know, I kind of got over my dislike of people crying around me and just kind of allowed it to happen because it was 
a final moment of release for these people that I've worked with for ultimately four years, even though I hadn't been with the, the Ghost program officially for, for three. You know, working with them individually outside of any official capacity, you know, skill work, etc. And and mentoring pastoral work that I was doing with them. So really some of them I've been with for four years. And it was it was good to see that moment. And I think from then I realized that, whoa, well, I didn't know that that, you know, this this basketball thing meant that much to these kids. I knew they cared, but this was different. Well, that's powerful, Coach. Um, and it's those memories, I think, that we'll, we'll, you will always remember. They will remember. Um, and people forget it's, it's, it's all about competing as well. You know, as you mentioned, being on the final, some people say you've won already because you've made it to, that, to the big stage. You've made it to the final. Um, and those are stories, as, as I said, um, will always always be told, which is is fantastic for the club, fantastic for the players, also yourself as a coach for experience, you know, learning from those games. Uh, moving uh, to now Lancashire Spinners, which is um, your, the programme that you've taken over in terms of the men's head coach role, I believe, uh, this past season. Um, so you've been coaching at different age groups, I believe this is your return back to the men's coaching. Is that correct? How was that like? And how's it like coaching uh, a winning D3 program, which consists of um, professional and ex-players who have played at high levels? Yeah, it's, it's a very different dynamic from coaching the uh, youth basketball, particularly girls. Um, and again, as I say, it was just a confluence of a lot of things happening at the same time for a lot of different people um, when it needed to happen. As I said previously, um, I was looking for a different challenge at the end of that season with the under 18s. And like I say, I didn't know that that challenge would be this and away from that club. But in having discussions with um, the directors, I spoke in particular to Guy Rose and Mike Nichols, and they presented the project to me, spoke to me about what it is that they were trying to achieve, um, their goals for the overall uh, basketball program in Lancashire Spinners with the boys and the men. Uh, and over those discussions, it felt like something that I could buy into. And lend my own skill set to to be able to achieve uh, those goals at least in terms of um, the men's team and starting that um, and the very first thing that happened obviously was um, having the trials now when the the day of the trials I hadn't been confirmed yet officially as head coach but that was the day of our final discussions um, between myself and the directors. And I pledged to at least help them look over the people who were trying out and help them make some selections. And as I was doing that, and I saw, you know, the people that came to try out and the level, um, I'm obviously thinking about the conversations we'd had previously. I decided, um, you know what, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. And I didn't tell them, sorry, I, went, I went away and slept on it just to make sure. That's how I felt. <laughs> and I called them in the morning and I said, I'm in. Um, and that same day that I said, I'm in, um, I got a text message from Connor Porter who was at the trials and one of the players we selected, he previously played for Lancashire Spinners in his previous iterations. And, you know, his message was, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to working with you this season. Like, you know, I'm all in, you know, if you, if you want me in the team, I'm there. Um, you know, basically a very enthusiastic message. And Connor's 
someone that I'd known for a while previous um, from Manchester Magic, uh, where he played as a junior as well. And I'll be honest, he was probably the keystone to everything falling in place in terms of building the roster going forward and sort of being a key part of the philosophy that I had for the program is literally exactly the type of player that I would want in the kind of uh, system that I uh, ended up coaching with those guys. Um, he was our captain uh, this past season. Um, and he was among the five players that made the, the season team of the year. Um, you know, one thing about Connor that everyone who's ever come across him in a basketball sense will know is that he is one of the better perimeter defenders you can come across at many levels in this country. You know, hardworking, intense, and intelligent as a defender as well. But the one thing he did more this season than he's ever done before is score the basketball, and he done it in a lot of different ways. Um, definitely developed great consistency in his three-point jump shot. And, you know, he's a terror in transition. He's one of the fastest players in the league. You know, I, I can put that against anybody that wants to challenge that. Um, and just his raw intensity, as quietly as he does it on the court, there's no choice but to follow him if you're one of his teammates. You know, there's the, you can't be on the court with him playing the way he does and you don't up your game. It's just not possible. He's one of those people. So he was very crucial to, to us being able to have the success that we did this season. You know, um, I left it up to the players at the beginning of the season to say what it is that their goal is. And each one of them straight away says, we want to get out of this division. We want to get promoted. So knowing that, I sort of tailored my approach and my delivery and my focus into helping them achieve that goal. If they had said something different, I'd have approached it differently because, you know, ultimately it's for the players. Yeah, you represent the club, you want the club to be successful, but it's for the players. And whilst, you know, I'll say it myself, I am a good coach, I can coach doesn't matter if I don't have the players. Could be the best coach in the world with the, with the most inexperienced players in the world. You're not winning anything. If you've got good players, you're halfway there. So, you know, they, they were definitely the main part of what it was that we were able to do this year. And it was, I think, something that was needed for the club, something that was needed ultimately for the region. Because now, look at it, we got um, three teams in the region in Division Two North uh, pending our uh, the acceptance of our application to that league, and it's a kind of rebirth of a local rivalry with the Manchester mm -hmm. Magic at the men's level. So, you know, it's it, again something that happened at the right time for a lot of people. I mean, it, it sounds like there's been a lot of planning a lot of preparation in terms of delivering this program uh, you can see from the results of the first year because it's hard to to develop a, a national league program and to and reach instant success but it looks like you, you you know there was the coaches involved such as yourself and the team very experienced um, the players that are coming in you're very familiar with the talent being in the Northwest region. Um, some, as you mentioned, uh, players that you've previously coached or seen around, uh, which you, makes it easier for you to kind of understand what system you're going to build around the program. Um, and to see and to hear the players have aspirations already, big aspirations to go up, uh, it seems like, yes, we can do it. And achieving it in your first season uh, is actually really, really, really impressive. Um, as you said, you definitely need talent. And that's what I feel like you've, in a way, recruited with, with the coaches and you've done a great job to do so. Um, are there any games that really 
stuck out to you in terms of when you were competing at that level, any games that you that kind of defined your season that made you think these guys are going to win. These are these guys are, have the capabilities to go all the way. Um, a few games do stick out in my mind, like um, in terms of defining who we are as a program, rather than saying that yeah, these guys are going to win. Um, that is something I just believed from the beginning mm-hmm. anyway, but in terms of defining who we are as a program. The first game that we had, obviously, in the league was the first, uh, T-side lines at home. Um, I'd done a lot of research into what would now be Division Three North, which was an, an amalgamation of Division Four and Division Three, as BE restructured the lower the lower divisions. Um, I'd looked into as much intel and info as I could find about all the other teams in the league, and I'd seen how much preparation and build up that T's outlines had had, and. We'd had some preparation games ourselves, obviously, in preseason. And uh, I'd seen our guys in action, and I'd seen some uh, preseason tape off T side. But that's kind of in isolation from each other. So you, you're never quite sure what it's going to look like, especially on the first day. And it was literally the first quarter that drew the picture for me as a. I think this this is this is the way it's going to be now. It's not going to be easy by any means, and it wasn't. But the intensity of how these guys approach the game, the focus, and ultimately the buy-in into the type of philosophy we have of play, um, definitely set a marker for anybody that was paying attention. And obviously we certainly were, were in it. And that was a bar that we set for ourselves that, okay, we cannot be any less than this, obviously. Because the idea is you get better as you go along. If we've started this way, we should only get better. And that bodes well for the future. So obviously getting off to a good start, especially at home was crucial. And the next key event or game for me was when we went on the road to play Tees Valley Mohawks. And for anybody that was sort of paying attention to Division 3 North would know they were an outfit to be reckoned with. But the thing I appreciated from that game in particular on the road um, and with the circumstances we were dealing with. It was the first time we were dealing with injury this past season and and unavailability for whatever reason. So we traveled to their place, not at our best in terms of personnel available, but looking at the game as it happened, it was by far, by far the lowest uh, scoring game we had this season. Um, I want to say between us, we probably scored 104 points between both teams. No more than that. And the reason I say it sticks out in my mind is that we were doing everything we needed to do offensively without scoring the ball. You know, that, that kind of uh, frustrating scenario you get where you get all the open shots you want, all the opportunities you want, but the ball just won't go in. But they never got disheartened or frustrated. Uh, the score was actually 39-36, I believe it was, or 39-35 in favor of Tees Valley at the end of the third quarter. When I said it was a low scoring game, I wasn't <laughs> joking. But then in the fourth quarter, we actually scored 21 points. So obviously by far our our largest scoring output of the game is like exactly when we needed it. But that only happened because they stuck to their guns, stuck to their principles, trusted themselves in each other, that they were doing the right thing just minus the results at the end. 
and it came right when we needed it to come right. But even more important than that was that we were able to stick to our principles defensively so that they weren't scoring at the same time we weren't scoring, which was our identity from the beginning. We wanted to be the best defensive team in the league, and I believe we were. If you're looking at um, points conceded per game, I think 62 per game, if I'm remembering correctly. And, you know, in a league that was actually a lot better than people realize, only conceding 62 per game is very good. You know, I said to them that we're not going to win this league by outscoring everyone. We're going to outscore a lot of teams, but that's not how we're going to win. You're going to win by forcing them to become who they don't want to be. You know, by the way, we play defense. We're going to make teams play faster than they want to, make teams play in areas that they don't want to play in. We're going to take things away from them. So that's the way we needed to do it. So that was the second game. And the second time we played Tees Valley was another situation where I thought, hmm, well, because this was not the first game. We were both scoring. <laughs> we were both scoring this time. And uh, Charles Smith, former Newcastle Eagles, who's player coach at Tees Valley, came out in the first quarter like, okay, you want to take this game, you're going to have to do it the harder. He came out five for five from the three-point line in the first quarter. Um, and even in the midst of that, we're still sticking to the game plan we had prior, um, according to the way we said we're going to defend him in particular and that the team overall stuck to the game plan as we understood it, didn't panic. And as we're going along, our lead is building slowly, 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 slowly and building our lead. Um, and even though we gave back a lot of those points towards the end, it was ultimately that commitment to what we do that sorts over the line. I think um, congratulations again, Coach, because that's a, an amazing achievement, as I said, to do it in your first year. But the, hearing the insights to show there's a lot of work that gets, be, that gets put into practices behind closed doors, you know, players buying into the system, um, that whole collaboration, that whole everyone working for each other, is the reasoning uh, that makes those, as you mentioned, those games, the difference between winning and losing, I think. Um, and it's clear to see uh, that everyone wasn't just saying that, okay, we're going to win this league. They really wanted to win the league. And as, as you said, we're going to win this from the get-go, from setting that standard in the first game, as you mentioned, the intensity, the, the levels of play, um, as you said, buying into the system in a way um, and understanding that this is how we're going to win the league. Even when it's not going right, we still need to find ways to make it go well and still play within that system that it will eventually go through, uh, which is, which is uh, an incredible achievement. Um, so now, you know, the season was, of course, postponed. Um, what is uh, due to the to, to the pandemic? But I believe that you guys finished all your games, which is you know which is great for the for the club. Uh, what is what do you see as the future goal for Lancashire Lancashire Splinters? Uh, do you do you see yourself um, getting promoted to the future divisions? Are you still going to be the head coach next year? Yes, um, I'm returning for 2020 2021. Um, this for me, is a long-term project. Um, it's not a fly-by-night type of thing. And a lot of our players that we had this past season, the vast majority of them have committed to returning as well. Um, plus, Fantastic. we've done some external recruitment as well to upgrade our roster and improve our depth. Um, so we've done a lot of that and got it done pretty early, to be honest. Um, the, the basketball community in the Northwest is very close and tight knit and a lot of people know the same people. So always being connected to these guys and constantly having conversations allows you to do that kind of work quite quickly and quite early. Um, obviously within the bounds of respect for their programs that they're with at the time, you know. And looking at it going forward, Obviously, we want to 
compete again in Division Two. Um, we feel we've got the kind of roster to be in and around the top of the table again. Um, I've got a, a good understanding of of the league, knowing the teams, the players, the coaches in the league, and what it's going to look like, or at least having a good idea of that. And knowing what our approach is going to be to attacking the season, um, I'm sitting here pretty confident that we're going to be amongst that reckoning uh, come the end of the season. But for me, more than anything, is trying to contribute to the ultimate development of the rest of the program that's going down to the juniors. Um, there's currently some work underfoot behind the scenes in terms of building a bridge between, or a better bridge, I say, between the junior program and the men's program. Um, and developing an overall curriculum for the club in terms of um, you know the, the teaching and the pedagogy at the younger age groups as you, again, uh, fill the pyramid going up. So there's connectivity from your entry level all the way down to eight years old as they come up through the program, hopefully through under 18s and ultimately into the men's team, which is, you know, that should be the ultimate goal of any program to be self-sustainable from within. And that's where we want to be. Um, again, there's no short-term fix for this. It's going to be a long, mm. long road. But we're, we're kind of laying the foundations for that. And, um, you know, I was able uh, to field an under-16 player back in December in a, in a D3 men's game, um, a young boy called Nathan Seshi. He was 15 years old at the time. And he actually, you know, gave a good account of himself in the game. He came in, um, obviously, as you'd expect, having never seen that level or competed at that level, he was very nervous. Um, you know, making nervous mistakes to start with. But, you know, the, the veterans in the team, the experienced guys, continued to show confidence in him, continued to find him in those spots where, logically, as a, you know, the way we played, he was open. And just said, look, just make a play. Just make a play. Don't worry about what comes after. And eventually he was able to score 12 points, shooting four for seven from three point nine. Um, and it was, you know, a good experience for him to kind of get in and feel the difference between what he's been doing in junior basketball at under 16s to what is ultimately waiting for you in men's basketball. You know, even at the lower level that we're competing in now the gap between those two is massive. Mm. And to be able to provide him with that experience for him to be able to take back to the juniors, to his peers, uh, to be able to make that comparison for himself and kind of explain to his cohorts that this is what's actually happening at a, at a higher level of basketball than where we are. You know, that's the type of thing that can help a program grow mm. and help the people within that program grow. So. Well, we're definitely hoping to be able to do a lot more of that going forward. Um, but there's, you know, no pressure or no rush for it to happen immediately. Uh, we have to have, let it happen at the pace that it happens, uh, stick to our principles, stick to our values, and just keep trying to develop the overall program in a way that's going to be sustainable. Great points, Coach. Is it... it it's exciting times for the spinners, as I say. Um, I, can, I can see it moving forward. Um, if you haven't checked out their website, it's pretty impressive as well. Um, a lot of information there for people who want to get involved. Um, I'll just touch on a few points that you mentioned, you know, the pyramid and the curriculum. Um, a lot of people always, yeah, you start from the bottom to the top, but I think it's safe to, I think in my view as well, it's more important, just as important to, from what happens at the top to the bottom, you know, uh, how the, the senior players interact with the youth, you know, get them involved in coaching, helping out the youth. Um, if there's no connection between the two, 
um, the youth will never grow. Um, as you mentioned, for example, uh, grow within the club. As you mentioned, you know, when that kid, the 15 year old played, um, I remember when I was thrown into the National League uh, team, uh, men's team, and I was nervous. Like, wow, it's a different environment, different atmosphere, seeing, you know, all these players, all these grown men. Um, and it's important the mentorship is there, the guidance, as you said. And that goes from the top to the bottom. If the men's team do not um, invest the time just as much as the coach in a way, uh, into the youth and, and helping them build and understanding, as you said, this is a pathway. This is for you to grow. You can eventually um, play on this team and see the opportunities. Then I think that's where the culture gets broken within a program, in a way. Yeah, um, you know, the old adage is you can't be what you can't see. You know, yes. so having that ultimate goal um, in the immediate area and the immediate infrastructure that they can see that they can aim for, you know, it definitely gives a, an impetus for harder and better work. Yes. You know, as, as it was in the past, and which was a key point in the discussions that I had with the directors as I was coming in, is that they recognized that, you know, previous iterations of the Nike Spinners senior men were almost entirely detached from the rest of the club for whatever reason. You know, initially at the beginning where the club became the Lancashire Spinners from what was the Rossendale Raptors, it was because of kind of the integration with a completely separate club, which was the Berry Blue Devils at the time. Mm. So as the two are coming together, they're already detached from what they were previously. But the work wasn't actually done with a focus to integrate in the entire system from top to bottom or bottom to top. Mm -hmm. And they kind of existed on their own junior program over here, men's program over there. Almost no overlap at all. And going forward, there was the partnership that developed with Maya School College which while it did connect to a youth program, it was a separate youth program and not necessarily the one within the club. Mm. Um, and that obviously presented its own dynamics as shown when the two bodies were eventually went their separate ways. They were left with Lancashire Spinners over here, Maslow College over there, both doing their own thing. And for the first time, uh, Lancashire Spinners senior men were left completely on their own. But now, just because of necessity, they did have to dip into the junior program to fill the roster in Division One, And that obviously came with its own set of challenges competitively. Mm, that season resulted in the team going winless. Uh, it was a struggle and ultimately resulted in what would have been relegation if the team had continued into the following season, which they did and they would do from the national leagues. So to, to their credit, the one thing that the club did after withdrawal was they didn't, you know, spend time feeling sorry for themselves or, you know, kind of sulking about the situation. They immediately got down to work to figuring out how they could have done this better and how they'll do it better going forward, which is what ultimately led to what it was when um, they revived the men's program and I ultimately came in to help with that project. And I think it's a, it's a testament to the club where they want the direction that they want to go. It's exciting because um, they're bringing in the right people. You know, they brought someone such as yourself, Coach Greg, who's got years of experience working at youth level up Northwest. Um, and as, as being the head coach of the, the men's program, I feel you will definitely have insight and input into how you can develop from the ground up in a, a program such as Spinners, which they 
from the sounds of it, have struggled previously to, to build that connection. So I think everything is falling into place, which is why I think it's an exciting team to be part of. Um, and it's great to hear the recent success that you have, and I'm sure the club will definitely build from that. Um, it's been actually, I think we're overrunning in a way. The, the conversations have been uh, so, um, so interesting. And when you told me that in the, one, of, one of the first sentences you said in the podcast, is that I'm a boring guy. Um, I like to challenge that because what the people don't see is that we've actually spoke 30 minutes, even 40 minutes before the podcast started about X and O's. And then I think we've actually spoken for like a, uh, maybe nearly two hours actually um, about, basketball in a way so i i think well, it's um it's I'll great to get is, your points what i'll say is the story is interesting not me <laughs> <laughs> um coaches it's, it's again it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today is there anything that you want to just kind of shout out um i know that you do side projects here and there so um anything that you want to mention uh well in the time and space where we are right now, I think it's important for me to acknowledge um, and appreciate a lot of the people that I've been having conversations with recently as regards to what is known as the Black Lives Matter movement. I was part of a discussion with um, a group of some rather important voices in, in British basketball um, last week on Below the Rim podcast. Uh, it was hosted by um, Darren, Adam, and Paul, uh, including myself, Rianne Bailey, Ishmael Fontaine, Will Reed, and uh, Miss Benny Bonsu, who is a part of the board at Basketball England. And if anybody hasn't seen that discussion, I do encourage you to go and check it out. You know, it, it was very open, very frank, um, and you, you, you're more than likely to, to gain a perspective that you might not have had um, from hearing that discussion. And I also host a, pro, a podcast along with uh, Michael Case, who even, we both mentioned a few times in this podcast. Mm -hmm. um, we call it Dem Man Day with Greg and Case. It's available wherever you get your podcasts. Um, uh, at them and their underscore pod on Twitter, give us a follow, and you can find any episode you're looking for. There, I think we're 15, 16 episodes deep if I count the bonus episode in there. Uh, so, this has been going for four months now. And um, to be fair, it's not actually a basketball podcast, even though we're both basketball guys. Um, we do talk about some basketball here and there because it's what we're both into. But more than anything, it's like a society and culture podcast. We talk about things that are affecting people um, around us and things that we see affecting the society around us. And we just sit down and have that, that conversation every week and offer our own perspective and try and gain understanding from each other about what's going on. So um, if that's the kind of thing you're into, definitely give us um, a look. Um, I'll say it again, at them and their underscore pod d-e-m-m-a-n underscore pod on twitter thanks coach i think um you touched on some some really important points um definitely check out the podcast because i do follow the podcast um not just because i know you guys but of course i'm very interested in the actual conversations that you have off the call and what is happening around uh, the world at the moment. Very interesting insights. Also, do check the Below the Rim podcast um, on that episode on what's actually happening um, at the moment. Important uh, movement in Black Lives Matter, especially as you said, uh, there are key figures in the actual podcast itself. So it's interesting to, to see and speak out and learn more about the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, um, there are definitely people smarter than myself on there that you may want to listen mm -hmm. to, even if you don't want to hear from me. So uh, I encourage you to do that. Thank you, Coach. It's been a, a really good conversation. Um, and yes, we'll definitely catch up soon. Um, take care, um, stay safe, and we'll catch up again. Yeah. Thank you, Clive. Take care. Thank you.